and I'm an effects intern here at Side Effects. Um, I'll tell you a bit about myself. I graduated from Bournemouth University in England around a year ago, and then I worked in films and TV in London before coming here to Side Effects. Uh, my main focus uh, is effects because I really enjoy sort of simulation and sort of problem solving and that kind of thing. But I also have a generous background, so I do other stuff as well. Um, so I'm going to show you my reel. You probably saw outside, but I'm going to show it again. opportunity to use some of the Houdini 18 new features to help create demo materials for the sneak peek video and the launch video and some other demo content on the website. Um, so the one, the gummy bear one was the one that was used at the end for the demo material and we'll go through that today. Uh, but first um, I'm going to be talking about the jumping body uh, simulation. Uh, it was um, more of a, like a learning project for me because I've never used Fern before so uh, I just tried to include as many features as possible just so that I could understand it a bit better um, so that I could create a better demo material at the end uh, so yeah so we'll just talk about this now um, I'm going to be going through some simple sort of Fern setup in case you've never used it before and I'll include some tips and tricks I find quite useful that might help you in your FEM simulation as well. Uh, but then I'll also go through from start to finish how I achieve this um, simulation. So let's jump into the... So uh, all these files will be online uh, at some point. So if you miss out anything, then you can grab the files after this or you can find it online later on. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a really basic FEM setup. Uh, this is just a teapot from Houdini. I just clean up a little bit uh, so there's no self intersections and that kind of thing. So, um, for a FEM simulation to work, you would want to give it a solid geometry uh, to begin with, and um, to do that, we can either use the solid conform or the solid embed. Um, we'll use the solid embed for this one, but I'll explain what the other one does as well. Uh, so you can see now this is the tap mesh that we can use to, uh, to do the FEM simulation. So normally for a good tap mesh we want even distribution of the tries. And to do that for the surface you can change this. I'm just going to increase this a little bit. So you can this is a bit more even now. And to check if the tap is good you should always um, use the clip node. So you can see that you can see exactly what's happening inside and this is important for the FEM solver because it's solving what's inside the, the mesh. And to decrease the size of your text inside, you can use the max text scale. I'm just going to decrease that a little bit. 
So you can see now it's um, sort of even across the whole mesh. So that should be okay to solve. So it's worth noting that FEM is um, resolution independent, meaning that you can start uh, your test on quite low res, get your material, get your parameters right, and then you can just up the resolution at the end and do a final simulation, final render. I'm just going to... Yeah, so we can drop down a dot back here. And to sim uh, them, we need a solid object and a fem solver. So I'm just going to drop down like gravity and the ground plane. So these are, you can just use the shelf tool obviously, but um, I'm just going through like, step by step. So maybe it will help you understand a bit better. So um, you can see the default is the default geometry, which is just a grid. If we just grab this, Oops. Uh, so yeah, your object is inside the .NET, and you can see this is our first FEM simulation. Um, so it's pretty straightforward to use. Um, so normally when you do a FEM simulation, you don't really want to simulate what you want to render as a final thing uh, because it's a type measure you need. Uh, so what you can do is use the embedding feature in, um, that FEM provides you. So here, for example, if I want to render this as a final mesh but with the simulation on top, we can just use the embedding. So I'm just going to... So in here, you can use the embedding feature. Just turn this on. So you can see that nothing changed. It's because it's still simming your tech mesh. However, if you go outside and grab the geometry. You can actually call out your embedded geometry in here. And now this has also got the simulation on it as well. So all you need to do is to provide it a path for the geometry that you want to finally render, and then it will solve your solid object, and then it will embed your render geometry on top of it and output this that's renderable for you. Uh, this is really good because um, that means you can solve, you can provide it something that uh, is not exactly the same as your render geometry, because your render geometry could be a high poly with lots of detail, and you don't really need to sim all those details. So this just gives you an approximation of what you can simulate. And with this, you can also see that there's this enlarge offset, which is, uh, it should be bigger than your embedded, the geometry that you want to embed, because um, in that case, then you won't lose any deformation that it is doing. So uh, in Houdini 18, the update was the new material model. So that's the new uh, NeoHookin model. And this will only work if you make sure the solve method is on GNL. So if you change it to GSL, it's not uh, So it's on by default, like those two uh, are set to the right thing at the beginning. So if you change it, then make sure you change it back. So um, there's another thing that we can do to check the quality of your type mesh because it's quite important to make sure that you're not giving it something like a bad type mesh to, to solve because the results will be um, like maybe broken or something like that. So to check that, you can go in your solid object and turn on the attribute, the quality attribute in the attribute tab. So it's off by default. And you can see there's all sorts of attributes that you can actually output to check your um, sort of your simulation quality. So in here, I'm just going to... So you can see there's a, an attribute called quality. It, gives you, it tells you how good the quality is of your tech mesh. So before you sim, after you prepare your uh, geometry, you can just put it in the fan solver. The first frame which just tells you straight away what the quality is like. And to visualize it better, you can drop down the fan visualization node. And you can see there's all sorts you can look as well. Oops. Uh, so you want to turn on the mesh quality. 
and green means good, uh, red means bad. So you you can use the color to see if, if the mesh is good, or you can just go back to to look at this. Um, so I'm going to show you what a bad mesh looks. So here I've got two meshes that came from the same geometry, but they've got different topology. So for this one, if I put it through the fan solver with this topology, it will tell you that it's it will tell you that it's um, pretty bad. Quality, they're all below 0 0.5, and that's not ideal for a fan sim. So what you can do is just to go through like a normal sort of cleaning up your polygon workflow where you turn it into a VDB, convert it to a polygon, and then you can remesh it. Now, you can see that it's a lot happier for, for solving. So um, if you want to poly reduce your mesh, then you'd want to make sure that uh, you're equalizing this one. Because if it's not, then you can see it's, um, it's not even. Yeah, just turn that to one. So, um, I want to talk a bit about constraints um, because normally when you do a FEM simulation, you want to drive your FEM sim with an animation. Uh, the first constraint I'm going to be talking about is the target constraints. So, there are two types of uh, target constraints in FEM. So one of them is the built-in target constraint and the other one is not the built-in one. And the built-in one allows you to do a um, like a smooth um, sort of constraint with to your animation. Um, and the other one is sort of like a it just pulls the point directly. So normally if you want to just slightly influence your animation, you want to use the built-in one. And I'll explain to you how it works. So um, for example, I've got a geometry here. And I turn it into a solid mesh, and I animate it. So now the target um, constraint takes in the target part, the target mesh, and your mesh needs to have the exact same topology as your input mesh. So you can see this is my target, and this is my input mesh, which is the static sort of first frame. And then I'll input it, and it's the same setup. You have your solid object and your pent over. So all you need to do is to put in your uh, original mesh, and then you can use this target definition here. You can just turn it on and put the path of your target geometry. I'm just I'm going to hand it right up, uh, just to show that it's working. So uh, the same thing can be done with a different method. So you can, if you prefer using like facts and that kind of thing, um, you can just. Um, Give an attribute called target P, which gets the position of your animation, and it will store it as a separate attribute. So in here, I don't need this path anymore because I can just use a sop solver, and I'll copy the target constraints onto the solid mesh, so every frame will get the new target information that you can follow. It's the exact same thing; it's just a different method. So just sort of, uh, you can pick what you want. So if you just want a one-to-one -one sort of target, then you can use the, um, the not the built-in constraint, the, the, the other one, which is going to be a lot quicker. So what you can do is to turn on this attribute called pin to animation, and it's an integer, so just make sure that you declare it's an integer. Um, so you, it still needs the path, but now as you can see, it's like a one-to-one, -one, it's pinned to the animation, basically. So it's a lot quicker if you just need the exact same animation. And you can also do that with point groups as well. Uh, I'm just gonna, so the pin to animation is the same as just using target constraint and turning it to hard. So if I give a point group here, and say that I want to pin to these points, Just be pinning to those points. So 
So these are sort of the basic sort of target constraint that you can use. It's very simple to, to use to drive your animation. Um, however, most of the time you don't get your animation. You, you don't want to animate your animation after. You don't want to animate your geometry after you turn it into a solid mesh. You would get the animation before that. So, for example, if I get this from an animator or from a mocap clip somewhere, it's already animated. Then my initial thought was that I would turn it into a solid object, and then I just point deform it, so it would just have the same topology, and um, with the animation, and this will work. This will work as well. Um, however, it's actually not ideal to use a point of form on a tet mesh because um, you could potentially cause the tets to be inverted, and then that will also create a bad tet mesh that would maybe break your simulation. So uh, I'm going to show you a way where you can get a target uh, tet mesh that is uh, more nicely prepared. So here I've got this um, animation, and I made this in Make Human, and then used Maximal for the mocap. So it's not amazing animation. So let's say I want to make this into a uh, fam simulation. Instead of point deforming uh, the entire tech mesh, I will actually just take the outside, the surface and give it the animation that it needs. And then I will point, I will target constrain only the surface onto the solid object, and then I will let the inside tech mesh just sort of use the fem solver to solve itself. That means the output will have a way nicer sort of inner tets, and that will be avoid all the problems that you could have. So um, in here, you can see that I'm only taking in the animators of skin level. And I'll attribute copy only on the surface points of the tet mesh, so only the wrap points here, and only the wrap points will get the target animation. And then now I'll just let the fan solver to to do its thing, and then it will have the exact same animation, but it's a tet mesh now with good tet mesh inside. So now this will be a good um, geometry to input into your fem simulation to do the final sort of. Uh, targeting. So, in here, I'll just put the um, geometry that we made from the same fem solver into this new fem solver. And um, I also made it a bit more art directable. I used some sort of bounding shapes <laughs> um, to give it some sort of variation on the, on the tiger strength attribute. Um, so, you can paint uh, on it, obviously, but you need to make sure that um, it's painting as a volume because you want the inside to also get the, the uh, attribute as well. So I think the new paint shop is good for that as well. But I don't like painting because it's quite destructive. Um, you have to repaint every time you change something. It's quite annoying. Uh, so I just use this, uh, shapes. Cool. So uh, this is a multiplier. So you just use, just put uh, whatever number you want, but just not zero, I guess. Um, and then you just let it solve. I'll show you. So here I've got um, the first sort of test that I did. Um, I'll call this a single layer approach because it's only simming one layer. Um, in FEM, there are a lot of way, a lot of ways that you can actually do a multi-layer simulation without actually having to do too much extra work. So, for example, I don't have a muscle rig, or I don't really have time to, to build one, and but I still want like a few layers on for my simulation. So um, I'm going to just show you this workflow that I have, which um, you can just have a better simulation and a bit more customizable without doing too much extra work. So, um, so instead of putting my sort of body mesh onto Mixamore, I'll just put this skeleton mesh on Mixamore. And um, it's just like that. Um, so I can't, at this, this uh, geometry I actually can't distribute because I got it from uh, another website. But I'll give you the link so you can just download it for yourself. Uh, so I just chopped the arms off and legs because um, 
don't want them. And so this is uh, one of the geometries I need, and then I also need a muscle layer and a sort of fat layer. So I'll just show you. So obviously my fat layer is the outermost layer, so I just want it to be a little bit bigger than my muscles, or you can have it sort of just whatever size you want. And ultimately I just want my layers to look like this. So I'll have the bones to drive the muscles, and then or the muscles, and then the muscle to drive the fat, and then the fat will be together with the skin layer to create some wrinkles. Um, so let's go into detail into how I prepare each uh, sort of layer. So with the skeleton, I'm going to use the same target constraint method that I just showed you, where I constrain the surface onto my... Uh, no, I constrain my tech mesh onto the surface so that it will get the animation without having sort of inner tech problems. Um, I'm going to also show you that, because my um, skeleton was done in Mexico, so this is kind of deforming the whole mesh as one thing, so it's deforming not in a realistic sort of bones way, because bones should be deforming in a rigid manner, right? So I'm going to show you if you have proper bones, um, for example, I'll take these here. So if you have a rig, for example, and it's sort of moving as a, each individually as a rigid, then you actually don't need to use the target constraint method. You can Grab the bones, so you can, for example, use this, or there are other methods as well, but I'm just getting the lines. I'll just take out the thigh. You can use poly white. Because your bones geometry, it doesn't have to look like bones. It could just be something that drives your muscles. Depends on how realistic you want it to be. Um, so this will work too. Um, so I will extract the transform. And now this will give you all the information that you need. And then you can just use transform pieces to apply this animation onto your tech mesh. And now you can just use this as your target mesh that you can constrain to. Um, so uh, if your, your, your mesh is deforming in a rigid manner, then you can use this method. If not, then I would recommend you to just use the target to the surface uh, triangles method, which is what we're going to be using for this. Uh, so the muscle parts, um, and the skin parts are prepared in a similar way. I just need to give it an attribute called region, and then, oh, whatever, uh, region, whatever you want to call it, um, it's just to identify which part it is. And then you can give it a fuse PID, which we will use as, uh, for the fuse constraint. That will constrain the muscle layer and the fat layer together. So we'll just merge them together, and we'll use a solid conform. And I'll explain why we will use a solid conform instead of a solid embed in this situation. So for example, I've got sort of three layers here. And if I'm using a solid embed, because it's giving you an approximation of your input mesh, it's not going to retain all the information that you, you need to, uh, to sort of do a multi-layer simulation. So you can see that if I want to just take out the muscle layer, for example, it's, it's losing a lot of the information that you want. Whereas if I use a solid conform, which it tries its best to conform, to create a tech mesh that conforms to your original geometry, so you can see that you can output a way nicer layer that you can, you can simulate with all your information. For example, you can see that um, I want this to this in my fuse ID, and I just want to retain that information, and the solid, con uh, solid embed will not allow you to do that. So in this multi-layer um, example, I would recommend using a solid conform. So in this solid conform, we will also want to check on add surface triangles. And what that does is that it will um, add some surface triangles um, <laughs> uh, that you can use as a skin layer. You can see these are the extra polygons that you can input. Uh, it will, you can use that to create wrinkles and stuff. Um, so you can see we've got the muscle layer, the fat layer, and then the skin layer. So before we simulate it, let's check the uh, tech quality. Cool. So yeah, there's an, a thing that's okay. Um, so yeah, we could now put it in. 
So we have got three uh, objects here. We've got the muscle, uh, the skeleton, the muscle, and the skin. For the skeleton and the muscles, we are using solid object, and the skin we will use the firm hybrid object. And the firm hybrid object simulates both uh, tetrahedrons and polygons in a single object, so it's perfect for doing sort of fat and skin layer. So the um, parameters are pretty similar to the solid object one. The one thing that I would uh, sort of mention is that if you want more wrinkles, you want the difference between the shape stiffness of the shell and the stiffness of the solid to be bigger. So the bigger the difference of those two, then the more wrinkles you would generate. Cool. So um, the first layer, which is the skeleton, we want to get the animation. And we'll just use the target constraint method here. So we're just copying the target P onto the surface of the skeleton. And then they will get a one-to-one -one sort of um, moving animation. And then now we want to use the skeleton to drive the muscles. And here I'm actually using a region constraint. And um, I will show a similar version. So for example, got like a little animation that I want to use this to drive this solid. In this case, I will use a region constraint because region constraint doesn't require two matching geometry, so you can just put them both as solids, as solids and then just put it in here. And now, if we solve it, you can see that it's sort of influencing the solid mesh. So you want to turn off the collision because uh, if you just want it to influence the the final thing, and if you turn on collision, it's just going to explode. So yeah, avoid that. Um, so yeah, so in here we're going to input the muscles and the skeleton and just region constrain them together, meaning that the muscles will now get the animation influenced by the skeleton. So for this first layer, it will look something like this. So let's say you're happy with that. You can now add the um, the skin layer on. So you can do this in sort of different dot nets, but I'm just putting it together so you can go back to it um, in a clearer way, I guess. So we'll have the skin, and we'll use a fuse constraint to fuse the outer muscle layer onto the um, fat layer. So the fuse ID will. Um, would be this this blue bit. So I want to fuse this blue bit onto the inner of the skin layer. So how does the way the fuse constraint works? I can show you in this example. I've got two sort of box objects, yeah. and they share the same uh, fuse ID. So the point that you want them to fuse, you want, you want them to share the same fuse ID. So the blue bit is what I want to fuse together. And now if I have turned this off, it will just sort of, because uh, this bit, this one has got target constraint on, so you can see only one of them has sort of um, uh, got any information. And then if I turn this on, and then put on the layers, which are both solid objects, or it can be hybrid object, obviously, um, you want to change the match method into point attribute, and then give in the attribute of the fuse ID, and now if I play, you can see that it's just fusing that layer together. I think it's just solving those two points as, as one point. So this is great for doing sort of muscles and skin layer. So, cool. so we'll just get something like this. Um, it doesn't look too much different from like a single layer one, but you can now see that you can it, it can be so much more customizable, and you can have different parameters for each layer, and then it will create something uh, that's quite art directable. Like if you want more wrinkles, you can just turn on uh, more wrinkles without really affecting the muscles and stuff like that. So I think that's quite nice. Um, and here I can I've done some sort of stiffness variation. <laughs> So to do that, it was the same method that I used with the target string. 
I'm just using some sort of bounding shape to transfer the attributes. I'm going to check the inside again. And it's again a multiplier. So all these attributes that you can pretty much override, um, just make, just hover over and then it will tell you what, what's the name of a parameter that, you, that and then you can just uh, sort of give an attribute to that parameter and then it will take in and multiply to whatever you have in here. It's quite semi-procedural, I'd say. So all you need to do now is to give it a different bone animation and just run it and it should work. And you might have to change the parameters a little bit according to your animation, but I think this app is pretty nice for sort of getting quick feedback on sort of just spare movement and stuff like that. So um, let's do something more complex. Which um, <laughs> so I just use the same method on these gummy bears, and I also use the bones, as you can see outside. <laughs> I just render the bones out because uh, why not? Um, <laughs> and uh, so let's squash them. So we'll be squashing them now. So this was the demo material that we used for uh, the Houdini 18 launch video. This was mainly to show the improved fall in preservation in Houdini 18 with the updated uh, solver. So I will share with you how I did the compression. But I'll be using spheres, uh, firstly for distribution purpose, but also it's just a bit quicker. So to do compression, I've got um, two stages. One is settling and the other one is compressing. And the settling is mainly to get a nice sort of starting point for the compression. So I just sort of um, copied it to a tube and then just sort of let it do its thing. Um, give it a set of objects so it can collide with the cylinder. And I just let it run. So here I want to share some sort of workflow that I use when I'm doing simulation. Okay, um, I want to show you how I do wedging with PDG. I don't know if you guys are uh, like that, but I'll show you guys how I do it. Um, so I'll put your simulation and you can connect it to a ROP geometry output and give it like a nice path that you can later refer back to with all your information. So I've got my wedge index, my my file structure, and then I'll have the attribute that I want to wedge. So for example, if I want to wedge the damping ratio, because maybe I know the value is between 0 0.5 and 1, but I don't know what the perfect value is. And I'll just give it an attribute called damping. And then I will I can create a top net. <clears throat> And I can drop down a wedge node and tell it how many wedges I want, give it the attribute name and sort of the range you want, for example, one to one to one. And I'll link that to a rock fetch, which is fetching your rock path. And that's all you need to do wedging. So all you need to do now is to dirty all and cook output node, which I'm not going to do now because it's going to take a while. Um, so normally after this, you go make a cup of tea, come back and you'll have all your files nicely and then you just do your, you can just choose one that you like and then you can do your final simulation on that. Uh, so I chose this frame as my sort of settling point. Uh, now for the compression to work, um, I originally just hand animated my compressor. Uh, unfortunately that could create problems. So if you're compressing something more than it can be compressed, it's just going to break. Um, so I'm actually using a very sort of simple math here to find out the maximum height of where it can be compressed. Also, so if you see the volume of a cylinder, it's calculated by this sort of area times height. So in Houdini, you can use the measure SOP to get most of your information that you need for these kind of calculations. So here I'm just measuring the area of my cylinder. And then here I'll be measuring the volume of all my little spheres. And I'll use an attribute promote to add all of them together so I can get the total volume of all the spheres. With the area that we just got with the measure soft, then we can just use this the same uh, equation 
to find out the maximum height of where the compressor can go before over compressing uh, the solids. So this is the value that I'm using here. Um, so I just hand animated it, uh, but obviously you can do uh, you can use other methods as well. Um, so make sure that you're not animating it below that value. You just want, you can run it up, but don't run it down because it will just over compress. So, um, so obviously this method only works for a cylinder, so if you're using anything that's different shape, then you'll have to figure out how to find that volume. Ooh, so, um, so this was the final thing. So it's not as pretty as the gummy bears, because um, it was more like it for demo purpose. And I didn't actually use embedding for this, because um, I forgot to. Um, <laughs> and I didn't want to redo the simulation, because it's, it's going to you know, take too much time. So you can see that my output is just some tech mesh. But obviously, I don't want to render that, because that's not really renderable. Um, so what you can do is to drop down a convert tech node, node. And that will just give you some sort of just the outside, your polygons. So now it's, it's renderable, and you can, you can render that. So um, one more tip that I want to share is so some post-processing tip. It's possible that when you're doing your simulation, you've got you will have some jitter. It could be well, it's jittering a lot and it's, it's ugly. And um, it could be due to a lot of reasons. It could be that you're over compressing it, it could be just your parameters are not really working well and stuff like that. But if you have no time to re redo the simulation, then you can just actually do some simple filtering with the chop net. So all you need to do is to input your geometry into this geometry chop. I'll change this method to animated and then give it the frame range. And then I'll use the filter to filter it. And now this you want to make sure that it's not too high because it will intabulate like too much and it will just lose all the animation. So if I make it give it a sort of a decent small number, then it will just sort of intabulate this little little jittery bit. And now I will just drop down the channel node and just revert back to the chop. So you can see that it's fixing all the jittery without losing any original information. So I think that's quite handy if you have got some issues like that and you don't really have time to fix it. So that's quite nice, I think. Um, so yeah, that, that's my presentation. And uh, I just yeah, I want to say thank you to Mihil, which is the developer of the solver. He's just so, yeah, he's at the back right there. And <laughs> you've got. Wondering what's the benefit of using fem over like the vellum soft body as a I'm novice to both so uh, so well personally I haven't used the vellum one too much but I, I believe that the fem solver is it's because it's physical based so it's more accurate okay so if you want something that's more high accuracy then you, you go for the vellum and then go for the fem silver yeah, okay I think vellum is a, maybe a little bit quicker Uh, the fuse constraints work by proximity then? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, they work by uh, identifier. So if two points have the same identifier, they'll be treated as the same point in the simulation. Okay, but if they are uh, away from each other and then by animation they get closer, <coughs> will they get fused at the point of contact or? As soon as the solver sees the, uh, that there's a fuse constraint and that those points are the same number, we'll immediately snap together. So right from the start. Hi. So if I <clears throat> if I ever encounter like super unstable simulations, which parameter would you first to like go to tweak and unstabilize it? Would it be substabs or would it be like well, I'm solver like constraint or uh, iterations? My, 
two main two things I would change is the substeps and the resolution of the mesh. Okay. Yeah, that those are my go-to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.